Uh, our next speaker is Avik Sengupta, and he will introduce Horus, robust background jobs in Julia. Please join me in welcoming the speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Pablo. Um, yeah, uh, the sun is coming out almost, so that's good. Um, so today I will talk about a package that uh, I've been writing for the last uh, few months uh, called Horus. And Horus is a package that allows you to run uh, background jobs in Julia. It's uh, similar to you know, packages in Ruby called like Sidekick, uh, or uh, uh, packages in, uh, you know, there are packages in Python and Java that does similar things. Uh, it's probably the most uh, similar in spirit to Sidekick, uh, but there are tons of other packages that do does this. So I guess the first question uh, when talking about this is, why, right? Why do you think, uh, why do I think we need uh, something like this? And uh, the use cases that I'm trying to uh, support are essentially if you have a process that uh, receives user requests, maybe a web server, a web application, uh, you don't want to be running anything that is either heavy compute or something that can block, is, can be, uh, uh, you know, can take time or is error prone. Uh, you don't want any of that to run while your user process is, uh, you, your user request is running. So you want to offload that to something asynchronous. And uh, that's the primary use case that, uh, you know, I think uh, we need to support here. And given that there wasn't an existing package in Julia that did this, um, I felt that this is something that could be done to a certain level of, uh, um, sophistication by a very simple package, and that's Horus, right? It's about maybe 200 lines of code uh, that you know, has a reasonable amount of functionality at this point, uh, but that functionality is very carefully calibrated, right, in terms of what it does support and what it doesn't support, right? Uh, so the primary architecture that um, uh, this project, uh, this package has is essentially to use Redis as a data store uh, and as a queue. Uh, so uh, the idea is that we have what I'm calling clients, which are essentially these uh, uh, Julia processes that receive user requests that you want to offload compute off. Um, and there are a set of processes that I'm calling servers or runners, uh, which essentially run the, uh, run the job, they run the program that you want uh, in an async fashion, right? And uh, uh, the idea is that you can have multiple clients running parallelly, uh, all enqueuing jobs, uh, you know, in parallel, and you can have multiple runners running in a cluster uh, that, uh, that are also you know, executing these jobs uh, parallelly. And the idea here is that the clients themselves and the runners themselves among each other do not communicate. All network communication is uh, via Redis, and so each of these runners are essentially uh, stateless or can be thought of as stateless, right? Uh, so, now, there are various ways of doing this. You know, there are different levels of transactional guarantees that you can, uh, that you can provide. Uh, what I have written you know, uh, gives you a few guarantees. So for example, one of the guarantees is that when you have multiple runners running, only one of them will pick up a job, right? So that's guaranteed, and that's guaranteed by uh, essentially the design of Redis's BR pop primitive, if, uh, you know, you're aware of uh, what Redis does. Um, you are also protected against exceptions in the executor that you uh, create. Uh, so, you know, the code that you're actually running, so you're sending an email or, you know, you're making a database query. If there's an exception, you know, everything runs within a try-catch and, uh, you know, you're protected against that. However, you're not protected against crashes of the runner process itself. So, you know, if you run out of memory or the computer itself crashes, you know, it'll just crash, right? Uh, because that's the very difficult thing to do. Uh, and, you know, I wanted something simple that works, that works in, you know, 80, 90% of use cases. Uh, if you want something to be completely transactional, you probably want to use something like Kafka, you know, with transactional guarantees around, you know, receiving messages. Uh, for using Horus, what uh, I would recommend is to run a log aggregator that you can have, you know, a centralized place where logs go. And, you know, Horus logs a lot, and you can, from the logs, you can figure out, you know, yes, this crashed processing this job. You can do a manual workaround. 
Uh, you should also use a process monitor that if a job crashes uh, or a process, uh, you know, a runner process crashes, you can restart it automatically. Uh, so in this day and age, you would probably run it as in Kubernetes, you know, with all of these things sort of, uh, you know, available pretty easily, right? Um, now, when you're running the jobs, obviously the jobs can fail due to, you know, either the database being un unavailable or, uh, you know, the email server not being a, uh, up or, you know, logic errors in your code. Uh, what Horus tries to do is uh, when it sees an error, it will requeue that job with an exponential back off and expo exponentially delayed uh, runtime for that job, right? So, you know, it'll first retry after two seconds and then, you know, eight seconds and 64 seconds and so on. Um, and that it tries, tries that for 20 times, and if it doesn't run for, uh, you know, if it fails 20 times in a row, and that takes about a day and a half, I think, at the current setting, you know, it'll put it into a dead letter queue where it won't be, uh, 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 where it won't be tried again, and it'll expect a manual, uh, uh, some manual workaround to uh, work at it, right? So, uh, and you can use this facility to explicitly schedule jobs at a particular time. So you want to run the job in an hour, you can use the same facility to retry uh, to NQ at that time, right? So let's quickly go to maybe a demo. So th and that shows you, you know, what what you as a user has to do. The first thing that a job is described in a struct, and that struct contains all the parameters for that job. So in this case, I'm you know writing a job that adds something clearly, and it has a value that it adds, right? That's the input that you uh, send to that job, and this. This struct has to be available both in your client and in your runner or your server, right? And this, so you would probably put it in a package that you would use, and that would be available at both places. On the runner, you would describe the compute that you want to run using this horus.execute uh, method. So you would write your own method of this execute function uh, based on the type that you created. So in this case, you know, this is the function. Uh, that says, you know, when you receive an add job, what you want to do is basically add the value that it contains to a global, right? And if that global goes beyond a certain limit, uh, you would throw an exception. And you would then run this as a script by including the type, creating a server config that basically has, um, a, you know, descriptor of uh, where your Redis server is running, and you would start the runner, right? That's all you would do. Um, so let's try and run that. Uh, you know, uh, Julia, and I would do that. Uh, okay, see the examples. And that, I have a minute, I think. So this is where, on, on the left, you can see uh, the uh, server starting up, include the exception before that. Uh, in another uh, uh, in another place, in another machine, you would you know run this within a web server, for example, where you would use Horus. You would include the type that you have, and then you would uh, say for you know here I'm running a loop and I'm enqueuing the job, and if you see in the job I have the configuration. Uh, and uh, okay, let me create the configuration, right? And for um, right, you have the configuration, and I create the add job type with a parameter that uh, you know changes. And on the left, you will see you know some of the jobs are executed, and then it starts getting the exception, and everything that is uh, that is an exception will get uh, requeued in maybe you know, 10, 15 seconds time, which we don't have for you to see, but believe me, it happens, right? That's all that I had to talk about. I think, uh, do we have time for questions? One question? No, no questions. Find me after that. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, the speaker.